Well, good evening, my friends, and welcome to another uh, Wednesday. Thank God for another chance to be with you and share with you virtually uh, with another virtual Bible study with the New Hope Baptist Church uh, here in Covington, Georgia. We thank God for this day. Today is June the 7th, year of our Lord, 2023. My, the year is almost half over, but we thank God for his mercy and his grace and his keeping power. We just thank God for all of you who consistently share with us every week with these virtual videos. Listen, as we say always, if it's been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to someone else. So we encourage you uh, to share this video on your time line. Well, listen, as we uh, come tonight, we want to remember the Walker and the Shy family in our prayers in the untimely passing of um, Brother Shannon Shy, 31 years old, uh, just recently passed, just on yesterday. I believe he's the son of Pastor Andre and Sister Cherie Walker Shy, 31 years old, just suddenly passed yesterday. So uh, we're keeping that family in our prayers. We're also praying for the Hardeman family in the untimely passing of. Dontavius Hardeman, who was murdered Sunday at the In Town Suites Hotel there, Extended Stay Hotel there in Conyers. So we're lifting up the Hardeman family. The Walker Shy family, the Walker and Shy families, as well as the Hardeman family. We're also lifting up all of these families that have lost loved ones tragically in gun violence it is it is it is remarkable uh how this thing is just it's in pandemic proportions all over the all over the nation we're losing too many people over senseless acts of gun violence so i, I want to encourage you listen uh we need to understand conflict resolution. You don't have to pick up a gun to solve your problem. Uh, it's not worth it. And we don't know who's, who's being lost. I believe that there is a um, calling on every life. I believe that um, every life has a calling. I believe God has a will for every life. I believe there's a purpose for every life. And so when a life is cut short, they don't have time to fulfill their purpose. But listen, that not only affects that life and that not, not only affects their immediate family it affects all of us because all of our lives are inter, intertwined and there's a reason and a purpose for our lives and i believe that reason and that purpose is not just for that individual but i believe that reason and that purpose has something to do with the lives of the world of the people in the world the Bible talks about the fact that David served his generation by the will of God and that he fell asleep. And I look at that passage as, and I understand it is that David had a purpose in his generation. And that purpose was had to do with making his generation better, serving his generation by the will of God. But I believe that's true not only with David, I believe it's true with every person. I believe every person has a calling, whether they fulfill that calling or not. But I believe every person has a calling to serve their generation. And that's a specific task that God has given them, equipped them to serve. 
And when that life is abruptly and prematurely cut short, they don't have time, they don't have the opportunity to fulfill that task. Now, remember I just said that task has something to do and serves the purpose of the generation. In other words, their, their purpose and their task is not necessarily about them, but it's about the world. And so when we lose them, we also lose access to whatever they were supposed to contribute to the world. And so that's why these, these murders, these suicides, these any untimely death is so crucial and so critical. Because it's not just about them, not just about their immediate family. Who knows? Some of the people who've been murdered may have the answer to cancer or may have been purposed to, to provide a, a service to the world that is irreplaceable. I think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You know, we, we talk about Dr. King. Of course, he died, uh, was murdered in Memphis. But a little known fact that a lot of people don't understand and don't know is that some 10 years earlier, Dr. King was stabbed in the chest by a deranged woman. I believe it was in, it was in Buffalo, New York. And the doctors say that if Dr. King had sneezed, or if that blade had been a millimeter of an inch in another direction, he would have died instantly. So, although Dr. King was murdered in uh, 1968, he could have died in 1958. And if Dr. King had died in 19, 1958, there wouldn't have been a I have a dream speech. There wouldn't have been a march on Washington. Who knows, the civil rights movement would have been drastically different. And Dr. King, just as he had a calling on his life and he fulfilled his purpose to a certain extent, every individual has a calling on their lives. So I think that's something we should think about uh, as we as we promote this idea of being selfish, short-tempered, because not only is an individual being killed, a dream is being killed, a purpose is being killed, value is being taken out of the world. So let's pray for these families. Uh, I was just reading earlier today. Uh, there was a graduation, I believe, in 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 uh, somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where it was. So much going on, I, I get stuff mixed up. People were shot at graduation. People can't people can't even graduate in peace. I heard of another case where uh, a person was was shot at a at a at a at a funeral of a person who had been shot, who had been murdered. I mean, it's just it's it's ridiculous. So if there ever was a time when the people of God need to be praying, trust me, that time is right now. I want to encourage you, don't have it up uh, tonight, but we will be having our call-in prayer line tonight, uh, tomorrow night, as, as usual, the Thursday night call-in prayer line. Let me see if I can pull it up while, I'm, while, while we're talking. I didn't put it up for some reason. I did not put it up uh, previously as I normally do. So just give me a second to see if I can just pull it up uh, right quick so I can share that number with you. Because certainly we need to be, we need to be praying. I mean, it is, wow. If there ever was a time when the people of God need to be serious about prayer, I'm not just saying these, 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 Sunday school prayer. Now, now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord myself. No, not those kind of prayers. We need to be sincerely praying. Because the word says, if my people 
which are called by my name shall humble themselves. Seek my face. I said during the sermon Sunday that I think one of the reasons why there's a lot going on and uh, we're not being healed, the land is not being healed, is because the people of God are so busy seeking his hand and not his face. But he said, if my people would humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways. We got to do right, y'all. We've been playing church too long. It's time out for that. We've got to be sincere. We've got to turn from our sins. God will not wink at our sins. There's no sense in, in, in going through uh, the motions of religion every Sunday, going to church every Sunday, and there's no change in our lifestyle. We, we, you know, so many people in church doing the same thing that people out in the world are doing. That's why we're not effective. He said, but if we do that, then he would hear from heaven and would heal the land. So let me just pull it up right quick. Yes, there it is. It's the New Hope Baptist Church prayer line. It's every Thursday night. And tomorrow night is Thursday night. So it's from 8 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. That's Eastern Standard Time. I encourage you, call in. You don't have to participate. You don't have to, you know, just listen in. Pray silently with us and those who are doing the active praying, verbal praying, you pray wherever you are. Because as we unify, as we are un unified in prayer, uh, that prayer is effective. The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous man availeth much. Elijah prayed and it stopped raining. He prayed again and started raining. Well, the Bible says he was a like man of passion, just as we are. In other words, there was nothing special about Elijah. He wasn't, he wasn't a superhuman. He wasn't divine. But he was a man who prayed. And when the people of God pray, sincerely pray, I believe God will move in a great way. And I said this during the sermon Sunday. You notice the text did not say, as we often quote, that God said he would heal the land. No, he said he would heal their land. Your territory, your spirit, or your circle of influence. God promised to do that. Because as far as the world is concerned, nature's going to take this course. The Bible, as my dad used to say all the time, the Bible must be fulfilled. Every generation, he said, will get wicked, wickeder and wiser. And as the old um, group used to say back in the day when I was coming up, they had a song out that said, there will never be any peace until God is seated at the conference table. So that prayer line is 774 Two two zero four zero two zero again. That's seven seven four two two zero four zero two zero. The access code once you call that number is 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. Well, look, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll be coming forth with our lesson for tonight. Tonight we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about uh from hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 we're talking about a great the great cloud of witnesses and uh i'm gonna ask the question who's watching who who's watching who we're gonna do an exegetical exposition of hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 I'm not gonna be before you very long tonight it's gonna be a short lesson and uh, so but it's gonna be an engaging lesson an exciting lesson and hopefully uh one that will help you along the way. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you even for right now. We thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to come in this virtual space. We pray, oh God, for all who are listening and viewing live, and even those who will view this video uh, later on. We thank you for them. 
We pray, oh God, your blessings upon them and their households. Now, Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, our sins of omission as well as our sins of commission. We pray, oh God, for forgiveness. Help us to be forgiving. For you said the word, if we don't forgive, you won't forgive us. And so, God, we pray now that you create in us a clean heart. Renew the right spirit within us. Help us to be all that you're calling us to be in these last and evil days. So that when people look on us, they won't necessarily see us, but they'll see you in us. That we, oh God, we will be your mouthpiece. We will be your hands. We will be your feet. We will be an examples. We will be examples of heaven on earth. For that is your will. That is your word. And so, God, as we come tonight, we lift up the Walker and the Shy family. We lift up Pastor Andre. We lift up Sister Sherry. We lift up the sister. We lift up the family in this untimely passing of their son and their brother, their cousin and nephew. It's 31 years old. But God, you're able. You're able, oh God, to comfort the bereaved. You said in your word, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so we pray, oh God, for your special comforting for that mother tonight, that father tonight, that, that sister. Just touch right now, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. We, we pray for the Hardeman family as they deal with the untimely passing of a loved one who was murdered. I read in the news report that the suspects are 17 and 15 years old. And we pray for their families. We pray for them, God, that you touch their hearts, you touch their minds, that they may turn their lives around and give their lives to you. Not just them, but all those of God who are perpetrating murders and acts of violence all over the land and country. We pray, oh God, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for those who are sick among us. We lift up Sister Doretha and Brother Moses. We lift up Sister Bunny. We lift up Sister Frenchie Johnson and we give you praise for uh, the report, God, she called the other day and was going in for potential surgery and come to find out because of your grace and your mercy, the surgery will not be needed. We praise you. We magnify you for that. We lift up Sister Theodosia. We lift up Sister Bunny. We lift up Sister Florine. And all who stand in the need of prayer. You are the great physician. Touch, oh God, now with your hand of healing. We lift up Brother Winston. We thank you for what you're doing with him. We lift up Brother Paul. Thank you for him. And all those, oh God, who you touch with your hand of healing and all those who you are restoring to health, we thank you for them. And we thank you for your acts of mercy. Now, God, get a, give us spirit of understanding as we study your word tonight. Blessed as to go forth that will transform hearts and minds that will be better equipped to be the people you've called us to be. This we pray now in the name of Jesus. Thank you and amen and amen and amen. Well, God bless you tonight. God bless you. As we said earlier, we're going to be talking about a great cloud of witnesses. We're going to be talking from Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to be looking at uh, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to do an exposition of that verse. Okay, so a great cloud of witnesses. 
who's watching who. An exegetical exposition of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. As I said earlier, tonight we're going to be real short. Don't have about maybe about 10 slides. We normally have about uh, 15 to 17, sometimes 19, sometimes even 20. But tonight's going to be short, only 10 slides. And so uh, hopefully this will be a blessing to you. Great Cloud of Witnesses, Who's Watching Who? An exegetical exposition of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And uh, we have that verse in three different versions in the King James, the ESV, and the new inter in the today's uh, new international version. King James says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The SV puts it this way, says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The today's English, oh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, today's New International Version puts it this way. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, here's the deal. I've uh, looked at some commentaries and I have uh, some commentaries from the uh, preacher's outline and sermon Bible. I have a commentary from a classic uh, Marvin Vincent's word studies in the New Testament. And I also have uh, some notes from the ESV or the English Standard Version uh, study Bible notes. And this is what they say. Uh, the preacher's outline in sermon bible says the picture painted by the author shows there are two senses in which the crowd witness the great christian race the crowd of heroes of chapter 11 have participated in the race they have run and finished the race themselves enduring to the end and winning therefore they are witnesses and examples for us but they're not only participants, they are also spectators. They actually witness our race and performance. They are vitally interested in how we run the race. Marvin Vincent in his classic word studies of the New Testament says this, says witnesses, and he gives the Greek word and it's pronounced maturu, Maturu does not mean spectators, but those who have borne witness to the truth as those enumerated in chapter 11. Yet the idea of spectators is implied and is really the principal idea. The author's picture or the writer's picture is that of an arena in which the Christians whom he addresses are contending in a race while the vast host of heroes of faith who, after having borne witness of the truth, have entered into the heavenly rest, watches the contest from the encircling tiers of the arena, compassing and overhanging it like a cloud filled with lively interest and sympathy and lending heavenly aid. The English Standard Version study note says this these are the old testament heroes of faith in chapter 11 as indicated by the by the therefore in chapter uh in 12 1 and by the greek word play between witnesses that is marty martis 
in verse one and commended material witnesses have a double meaning. One, those Old Testament heroes witness to their faith by their words and their faithful lives. And two, like spectators watching an athletic contest in the arena, they may now be watching or witnessing believers' lives. The first sense is the common meaning of the word. But in this verse, the imagery is of being surrounded by these witnesses give the sense that they are eagerly watching from heaven. And the image of running the race that is set before us might lead one to think of an athletic race in a sports arena with all these heroes of faith from chapter 11 watching as present day believers take their turn in the same race they once ran. However, nowhere else does the New Testament envision saints in heaven watching saints on earth, nor does it encourage Christians to pray to these believers in heaven or to ask for their prayers. So, in accordance with the comments of the previously mentioned commentaries, many modern believers believe this verse supports the idea that the dearly departed saints of old and even uh, contemporary saints who have departed are watching us from the grandstands of heaven, cheering us on as we run our race on earth. Therefore, the question we must consider is this, was this the intent or uh, the meaning the original author of the text wanted to convey. Now, the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a matter be established. Therefore, we need to know, are there any other biblical passages that suggest such an idea? And I want to I want to promote this as an aid to your Bible study. Whenever you run across something, uh, an idea or a concept, if it's truly biblical, a biblical principle, it is usually repeated in some form or another somewhere else, either in the Old Testament or the New Testament. However, even if this is the author's intent, this idea of uh, these Old Testament saints watching us from the grandstands, it's not found anywhere else in the text or anywhere else in the Bible. So let's look at the witness of words. So let's look at the witness of words. The Greek word that is translated as witness in the text is the Greek noun martus. And it's from where we get our English word martyr. And it means a witness in a legal sense, in a historical sense, one who is a spectator of anything, such as a contest, in an ethical sense, and those who, after his example, have proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by undergoing a violent death. Most of the witnesses in the Bible were martyrs. They died because of their witness. They died because of their testimony. We talk about Romans chapter 10. And I think a lot of times we don't understand the context of what Paul is talking about. What Paul says in chapter 10 of Romans, I believe it's around verse nine, around verse nine and ten, where it says, "If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved." He is writing that to the church at Rome. He's writing that to Roman Christians. That word "confess" in the Greek is the word "homo legio." It literally means, the primary meaning is not 
not our confession. You know, when we talk about confession, they were talking about, well, you know, we admit we did something or we acknowledge we've done wrong. But that is not the primary meaning of the word in the New Testament. That word homologio literally means, or homologio literally means to say the same thing. It means to agree with a statement. When we confess our sins, for instance, it means not, the primary meaning is not to acknowledge we've sinned, although that, that may be the case. The primary meaning is that we're saying the same thing about our sin as God is saying. We, yeah, and listen, <laughs> when we lie, we say untruths, and we call and we acknowledge our lie as a little white lie, that is not a biblical confession. That is not saying the same thing about our sin that God says. Because lying is a very big deal with God. In fact, lying, a liar is one of God's, is on the abominable list. You're reading it. I believe is Proverbs chapter six talks about six things. Yes, seven things God hates. And one of those is the liar. So lying, there are no, with God, there are no little white lies. You know, because lying is, it comes from the devil. So what I'm saying is that to biblically confess, we have to say the same thing that God is saying. So when we look at Romans chapter 10, when it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, it is saying that you must acknowledge with your mouth, say it verbally, that Jesus is Lord. Now, that word Lord is not talking about his deity. It's not talking about saying Jesus is God. No, Jesus is the master. Jesus is my owner. Now, here's the, here's the deal. Here was a stickler with the Roman Christians. Because the Pledge of Allegiance back in those days was Caesar is the Lord. So if Jesus is Lord, then that means Caesar is not Lord. And such a statement, if heard by the wrong ears, could cost them their very lives. They could be killed for treason. So it wasn't just a, it wasn't a religious statement only, it was a political statement. So that's that's that was the primary meaning, and that's the primary meaning of the word uh behind the Greek word behind the word confess in the Bible. So when we confess our sins, we're saying the same thing that God says about our sins. We're saying the same thing. We're calling up, we're calling our sins black, we're calling our sins disgusting. We're calling our sins an abomination. And one of the things that's happening today is that we, we dress up things. We minimize our sin. And we don't call it what God, we don't call our sins what God calls it. See? That's what it means to confess. So, this idea of witnessing here, the primary meaning of witnessing in the in the New Testament, not necessarily going out telling people about Jesus, but being an example, being evidence. I, I think Jesus was saying in Matthew in, in Acts chapter one, verse eight, where he says, you know, they asked him, you know, they said like the disciples asked him, Will you at this time restore the kingdom back to Israel? And Jesus said to them, in, in essence, it's not for you to know the time and season. That's in the Father's hand. But as for you, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea, in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in the other part of the world. I believe Jesus was saying, not necessarily you're just going to tell everybody about me, but you're going to be the example. You're going to be the evidence that I am who I say I am. You're going to be the evidence that I'm alive. You exhibit A. I think that's what he was trying to tell me. Now, in our text for tonight, he talks about a cloud, a great cloud of witnesses. 
And when you when you hear that hear, you see that term cloud, particularly in the in the New Testament, it talks about Jesus coming back on a cloud. Not necessarily talking about those those fluffy white things in the sky. I'm not talking about clouds in the sky necessarily. He's talking about a great number of people or a great number of beings. When Jesus comes back, he's come back on a cloud. He's come back with a multitude. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians that he's going to bring uh, the saints with him when he comes. Read that text carefully. He's going to bring the saints with him when he comes. Why is he going to bring the saints with him? He's going to bring the saints with him. He's going to bring the spirit, their spirits with him so that their spirits can be reunited with their resurrected and transformed bodies. And those of us who are alive will be changed, Paul says, in the twinkling of an eye. So this term cloud is not necessarily re referring to the, the fluffy, puffy white things in the sky, but is referring to a great number or a great aggregation of beings. In this particular case, the cloud of witnesses, the great number of witnesses that, that the author talks about in Hebrews chapter 11. And then we run across the word therefore. And my Old Testament professor, Dr. Edward Davis at Mississippi College used to always tell us in class, he says, whenever you're reading the Bible and you come to a therefore, always stop to find out what it is there for. Let me say that again, because I thought that was a catchy phrase. I always remember Dr. Edward Davis said that in, in our Old Testament class. He said, whenever you're reading the Bible and you come to a therefore, always stop to find out what it is there for. And in this case, the therefore connects chapter, chapter 12 with chapter 11. The therefore indicates the cloud of witnesses in chapter uh, 12, verse 1, are the heroes and the sheroes of faith mentioned in Hebrews 11. So he says, therefore, we are uh, surrounded by all of these people we just talked about. That's what he's talking about. The therefore means he's talking about the heroes and sheroes mentioned in chapter 11. So he says, we're compassed. We are surrounded, he says, by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, as I said earlier, the idea is that their lives were witnesses, evidence of the faith. When someone says, well, I'm a witness, what do you say? Are, are, it's not just you verbally saying, well, I'm a Christian. Are you verbally saying that I love Jesus? Are you verbally saying whatever the Bible says? Are you an example? Are you are you evidence? Are you an are you exhibit A? Are you exhibit B? Are you evidential exhibits of the uh, veracity of the scriptures or the validity of the scriptures? See, in their lives, we see evidence or examples of faith. That's why they are a great cloud of witnesses. Now, here is the gist of why we have this lesson tonight. Because while some commentary suggests the witnesses are to be viewed as evidence of faith, in a sense, the cloud of witnesses can also in some sort of way, be seen as viewing and cheering on the original Hebrew readers and by extension, 
Marlin Saints. And that could be the idea the author had in mind. I keep saying the author Hebrews because we, you know, we really don't know who wrote Hebrews. As as one of my professors used to always, Greek professors used to always say in, in, in Mr. College, only God knows who wrote Hebrews. But as mentioned in the notes earlier, you know, I talked about out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. There is nowhere else in the New Testament where it envisions saints in heaven watching saints on earth. Nor does it encourage Christians to ever pray to these believers in heaven or to ask for their prayers. You know, I hear it often uh, in reference to uh, loved ones who've gone on, well, you know they're you know they're in heaven. They're watching over us. You know they they'll they'll, they'll say at the graveside. Well, now I know you're going. You're going to be watching over us. But the Bible does not support that notion. There's no other text in the Bible that supports that notion. Now, although that may have been part of the meaning of this author of Hebrews, I believe primarily, he, you know, he used that this this idea of an arena, uh, not necessarily. I think not necessarily as them watching us, but rather for us to be watching them. Because their lives are the example. Their lives are the witness. And the reason I say that is because the Bible says that the saints who have gone to heaven are presently in a state of rest. Interesting passage here in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. This is the opening of the fifth seal. It says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood? on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who, were, who would be killed as they were was completed. Now we know these are martyrs. These are witnesses. They are martyrs. Because remember, a witness literally is a martyr one who dies for the faith because the Bible describes them as those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. We know they are in heaven because they are described as being, their souls rather, as being under the altar. The fact that they are told or they were told to rest a little while longer suggest they were already resting. There is no indication that they knew what was happening on earth. But their only concern was retribution for what had happened to them while they were on earth. But notice now, a white robe was given to each of them and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. So the point is, the saints who had the I know these are these are people who have been who were killed for their faith, but the principle probably probably refers also 
in relates to those who just died died naturally. All the saints who are in heaven. Look at Job. Let's look at Job. Job said, for now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. There in death, he says, the wicked cease from troubling. And there the weary are at rest. However, there would be no rest for the weary. If the weary, that is the, the departed saints, were watching over the living, how, how could they rest in heaven if they were aware and watching over what's going on with us? We live in a world of confusion. We live in a world of turmoil. We live in a world of wickedness. How could they be happy? How could they be at rest? if they were tasked with the uh, with the responsibility of watching over us you know I, I think and i'm not trying to be trying to be cruel but i think it's ironic you know you word your mama to death while she was living and then you want her to watch over you while while she's when she's dead i mean give mama a break see but the bible says that the departed saints are at rest Another witness, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, saints, from now on, yes, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Again, as in Revelation chapter 6, verse 11, the picture is the same it is a picture of the saints in heaven. They're not pictured as being actively involved or even aware of what is happening on earth, but rather as being in a state of rest. They're resting. How, you know, we, we, we often say, you know, may his soul rest in peace. How could his soul rest in peace if he has to, to look over, if he has to watch over us and all that we are going through? So often our theology does not come from the word. It comes from fables, common folklore, popular ideas. So let's conclude. As, as I told you tonight, the lesson is going to be kind of brief. Tonight's lesson will be kind of brief. So therefore, based on the linguistic and the contextual evidence, we can surmise that the main point of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, is not that of contemporary saints being watched or cheered on by departed saints but rather as that departed saints can be viewed as witnesses or evidence or examples that encourage faithfulness. Again, as we said earlier, there is no biblical evidence in the Old or New Testament that supports the idea of the departed saints being aware of watching or actively influencing the lives of contemporary saints. And I know there are religious traditions that support the idea, promote such an idea, but there's no biblical evidence for it. They're at rest. And then why, why, why do you need them? Why is there a need for them to watch over you? Because that's the job of the Holy Spirit and the angels. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 26, 
but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. Oh, yes, Jesus said something. Uh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Jesus said something. Uh, remember in, in the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Uh, when he had that conversation with the rich man and the rich man says, you know, to Jesus, send Lazarus back that he may tell my brothers not to come to this place. And Jesus says, they have the prophets. They have the scriptures to witness to them. And they would not even believe someone if they were to come back from the dead. Now check this out. There was one who came back from the dead and he's a witness. And there are many today who do not believe Jesus. But it's the Holy Spirit. He is our, he is our comforter, he's our guide. Not, not your dead mama or your dead relative, because they're resting. If they, if they, if they died in Christ, they are. Let them rest. You don't, you don't want them. You shouldn't want them to be to be burdened with the idea or the thought of having to watch over you, keep you out of trouble. You didn't listen to them when they were when you, when they were living. <laughs> you know, let them rest. It's the Holy Spirit's job, and. On top of the Holy Spirit, we have angels watching over us. The Bible says in Hebrews, same author, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 through 2, uh, chapter 1. It says, and to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my, a footstool under your feet? And he says, are not, are not they all, they are angels, ministering spirits, sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. My point is, you don't need mother or daddy to watch over you. You don't need you know, any of your relatives to watch over you. God has already taken care of that. He sent the Holy Spirit and he has angels watching over us and so even though it may be true that the hebrew writer may have had this idea in his mind of the old testament saints standing in the grand in the grandstand cheering us on there's no biblical evidence to support such an idea this is the only place in the bible where this idea is even suggested well, God bless you, my friend. I hope and pray that uh, the lesson tonight was a blessing to you. And uh, like I say, always, if this video has been a blessing to you, it'll be a blessing to someone else. Share it on your timeline. Um, well, that's it for tonight. Until the next time, may the Lord bless you real good.